What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. The true crime community is a small world. If I were to mention the Green River Killer, most anyone would immediately know just who I'd be referencing. As we've mentioned before, the Pacific Northwest has no shortage of serial killers. But who is tasked with bringing them to justice? There are many detectives, police officers, investigators, and prosecutors who have seen their fair share of criminals and the violence left in their wake. But there are a few who stand out as having been tasked with capturing the worst of the worst. Robert Keppel was one such man. From his time spent investigating and interviewing Ted Bundy, to his help in searching for the infamous Green River Killer, Keppel worked cases that would leave dark marks in his memory. This episode, we share one such case from early on in Keppel's career in law enforcement. The violent and brutal murders of two women in the 1970s would be something he would write on and talk about for many years after. Join us as we discuss the convicted killer, Morris Frampton, in our season four finale episode. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods. With your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the season finale of our fourth season. We are incredibly thankful to have made it this far with the podcast and to have you all with us. Back with me today is Bryce. Oh, hi. (laughs) You just gonna stare at me? Yeah. Hello, Bryce. Hello. You're back for the finale. Finish the season with me. Sorry, it's okay. Mm. Uh, any any news that you have? Um, any statements you would like to make? <laughs> any statements? Yes. Um, I, I don't know what we're gonna do after this. Take a fucking break. <laughs> <laughs> Take a break. Okay. No. Um, no, we're we have things. There there are things that I wanted to discuss and like update people on and i'm not doing this for attention how about that you guys have decided to bring us into your or wherever you listen to us on podcasts you know apple google spotify and we appreciate it and a lot of it i've struggled with like keeping our life private and separate and things like that yeah but i've for me, anyway, I don't know about Jess. Um, you guys have made the conscious effort to bring us into your your lives. And so I'm going to bring the conscious effort to bring you into our li- my life, anyway. Uh, the reason I was not here was we did lose my mom on March 13th. So I was in California with my brother and sister, and we were getting yeah. our affairs in order. Um, not something... I wanted to, but I feel like you guys are family and that you guys uh, deserve an explanation. And um, like I said, you brought us into your life. I'll bring you into my life. And, and it's not that that I didn't want to record. (laughs) I just, uh, Oh, you know, it it wasn't, it wasn't the time. And, you know, we, this, we value doing this, but it's, it is not a necessity you know what I mean? This this yeah. is something that we do in our off time. This is our this is our hobby, if you will. This is our, this is, our side hustle. Yeah, um, <laughs> and and you know there are things here that are going to come first, and family comes first. So, yeah. so we, you know, yeah, I I wasn't really going to say anything because I explained last time that you know in the last episode that I am a very private person as far as like social media and sharing, even on my personal social media, I, I'm very rarely on it. And if I am on it, it's posting a picture of the dogs, which 
you know, nobody really wants to see, but um, <laughs> <They do. Podcast laughs> I mean, I, podcast puppies, which I was thinking we haven't, we haven't posted a picture of the podcast puppies in a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it's, it's private and we don't, we don't ever want to um, give you guys too much information just because it, at some point you guys aren't going to care what I had for breakfast or things like that, you know, but I could post that stuff if you really are curious. And you know, if, if you really, I I always struggle because I'm like, yeah, who's, who wants to watch that or who wants to see that or who cares. And, but you know, this was a big, these last couple of months, well, this last couple of years have been a big struggle, I think for everybody. And we've now lost you know, Bryce's dad and mom during this whole pandemic. And, and it's, it has caused us to rethink some things in our life and, and how we um, go about with our families. Yeah. So we just, you know, we appreciate the time that you guys give us and we want to be respectful of that. But we also want you to know that, you know, there are a lot of things that go on in our lives that we just don't share. And and this was one of them that was just kind of at the time we didn't need to share it, but you know, I, you're comfortable with putting it out there then. No, I had a long time to contemplate. I drove to California, which if you guys don't know, we're in Washington and it's a a 12 hour drive, 11 and some change, but I had a lot of time to think about contemplate. I mean, I was just in my car by myself. So it's a, it's a long time to have to reconcile with yourself and a lot of questions anyway. Yeah. Your, your thoughts. Yeah. And then you start talking to yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate you guys and I'm letting you into my life, but also you guys have heard from my sister's my sister Renee was on, you know, a couple episodes ago. I'm trying to get my brother on, but we'll see. I know he's, he's a little busy, but if it happens, it happens. But yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've shared our family with you guys and, you know, our kids and, and the dogs and other family members. So, you know, we, I, yeah, this is, this is, this is a family, family business. Yeah. Crime, true crime, <laughs> true is, crime podcast is our family business. No, yeah. but uh, honestly, guys, <clears throat> you guys are have let us into your life, so we're gonna. Um, I wanted to let you guys into mine, so not for sympathy, not for 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 listens, but just you know, thank you guys for letting us into your life, and uh, yeah. and and thank you for being patient with us when we're not very present, yeah, in in online and and you know things like that, so. The, the podcast will evolve, and we're trying. I mean, there are a lot of changes this year for Jess and I. Like, we, you know, Jess got a, a big full-time big girl job. <laughs> so A career. Like, it's I, not just a job. Like, yeah. oh, this is, you know, what I'm going to do for a little yeah. bit. Like, this is a career. So that that was a change for me and working all these hours and everything. And, yeah, if Bryce wasn't home a little bit more, I don't think I'd be able to do that. So... Yeah, a lot of changes. And, you know, I don't, I, we don't ever want this to to be a second thought, but it, it does take a lot of effort to make it happen. And so when life changes for us, it, it makes it difficult to to work it in, to, you know, to make the time for it so that it's authentic and it's, it's, it's honest and it's accurate. You know, we never want to put anything out that's not accurate and that we haven't put our best you know, effort into. So yeah, we will do better with, with social media. That being said, we are taking some time off (laughs) and, and it's not easy to, it was not easy to plan to take the time off, but we, I need it. I need, I need to read something that's not about murder. I need to watch something that's not about murder. And I need to talk about things that are not murder yeah, and it's very hard right now to have any downtime that you know where I I just let my mind just relax so we are going to be taking a few weeks where we will not be bringing you anything 
However, we do have collabs, yeah. well, collab series coming up that is starting on April 13th, uh, which is a Wednesday. So it is a special release um, and that's going to be with true crime cat lawyer. Elise and Winston, Yay. the distinguished Winston. Yes. Um, so that is something that we've been talking about for a while and it just, it went so well, we decided to make it a series and Elise is an amazing person to work with and I I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Yeah. So we're excited for that. So that is coming in April. There's two parts to that first episode that we're releasing. So Wednesday the 13th and Wednesday the 20th, they will release. And then uh, we will get you future dates. So there, it's monthly release. We have our recording dates set, but we will work on the, the other release dates. So that is in the works. And then everyone's favorite, what the fuck's. What are is, coming back. What What is this what the fuck what that is, you speak of? What is this that you speak of? <laughs> don't honey? act like you don't know. I don't know. You have a whole fucking song <laughs> dedicated to it. I do? No, no. I don't. Oh, no. No. You couldn't, you couldn't bring that out at, at no. you know, just at the touch of a button. Mm-mm. Mm. Okay. Well. Wow. <laughs> it's not set up here. Oh, okay. This is our okay. serious podcast. Oh, stuff. sorry. Okay. I'll switch over to WTF when yeah. we're we're gonna record that. But yeah. Um yeah. so yeah, that will be coming June first. Uh it's a way a ways away. June first. June first. Yes. So we're not leaving you with nothing. No. We're also we're gonna try and leave you with other podcasts. In the interim, like, so you can yeah. just discover other true crime podcasts. So, I mean, if you download what happens in the woods and it's another podcast, you didn't come to the wrong podcast. We're, we're going to be hosting other people just so that you guys, I mean, if you guys listen to us, that'd be awesome. But if you guys get turned on to other podcasts that we actually collaborate with or that we, you know, um, communicate with, that's awesome too. We love this. We love to, uh, Spread the wealth. Spread the wealth. Spread yeah. the love. Spread the love. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that we can get some of our friends to um, release some of their episodes or, you know, one episode or something that they've already recorded and yeah. let us release it on our platform so that um, you guys can branch out and find find new podcasts that you might like. So, yeah, we, um, you know, we're just we're just out here living life. Yes. Trying to do things, trying to keep you guys entertained. And yeah, I think, I mean, that's all I have to share. Do you have any, yeah. anything else? What? UK. Outside the United States, United Kingdom is back. Back in, baby. Back in the league. Yeah. Besides the United States. Besides the United say, States. Yeah. Yes. And I saw that we were on the Apple True crime list number two hundred forty nine. Oh, <laughs> in in Israel. Oh, hello Israel. Hello Israel. <laughs> I I don't know how. I don't even know. Yeah. But that's amazing to me. I don't even care. Like what top of the list or whatever we may. I don't even care. That's just crazy that somebody in Israel has been listening to us. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I love it. I just, I don't know. I thought that was amazing. All right. Any, anything else we want to share? Uh, not at this time. Not at this time. Not that I can remember. I forgot I, to write yeah, all my I stuff down. Know. Oh, did you have more? No. Did I interrupt you? I'm no, sorry. No, no. No. Okay. We're good. Okay. All right. Well, I have a very... Disturbing convicted killer to discuss today. Are we ready for this? We're going out with a bang. Let's do it. Okay. When I tell you that this fucker is disgusting, I mean, it, it is disgusting and disturbing. And I will warn you, there is graphic description of the crime scenes. I will be as delicate as I can be. Um, but I will be discussing sexual assaults as well as mention of torture and i 
Well, I keep saying we understand if you can't listen to this episode and we'll catch you on the next one. There won't be a next one for a little bit. Um, no, but I don't yeah. want anybody to feel like I'm expecting them to listen. So uh, obviously do what you need to do that keeps your mental health safe. So the first victim I will be discussing was found in the early morning of July 30th, 1977 in Seattle. The body of a nude African-American woman was found in an unfinished construction site of what would become a weekly newspaper office later on. I don't know how you continue building a building when you found somebody murdered in the way that she was murdered there on the site. I, I would completely demolish anything that had been started and just close it off, like wow. burn it down. That's when money starts getting involved. People are like, I got to finish this project. I could not set <laughs> foot into this building. Yeah. I just couldn't. And it wasn't like it wasn't even finished. The scene was without a doubt one that would be enough to just freak anybody out. I mean, nightmares. The woman had quite literally been beaten to death and then her body was posed for effect. Her body was laid out with her legs spread open in sh facing a corner in the building so that her legs were raised up so that they ra rested on the walls. And mind you, this was concrete, okay. cinder block walls, concrete pad. So her lower parts were facing the corner of what would be a room and her legs up on each wall on either side of the corner. So very definitely posed for whatever reason that way. Yeah. The clothing the woman had been wearing was in complete disarray. Um, pantyhose and underwear were off of one leg completely and shoved down the other. Her shirt and bra had been ripped off of the body. It was tossed and the shirt was just torn to shreds. Her skirt had been shoved up and over her breasts. So it was around her armpits. And actually the skirt part was uh, like flipped over and covering her head. Okay. There were bloody drag marks from where her body had been moved into the position. So it's thought that she was beat in the front of the building and, and moved around to the back and into this area. Okay. There was blood drag marks, that whole area. And it was clear that she had been through a very rough beating to the head and the face. The victim was quickly identified as Iantha Buchanan from identification found in a purse at the scene. Iantha was just 27 years old at the time of her death. Wow. The last person to have known of her whereabouts was a gentleman by the name of Marcus Jackson. He was her boyfriend, but he was also her pimp. When questioned, he told police that he had last seen her leaving the Moore Hotel in Seattle about 9.45 p.m. the night before. And their usual routine was that Iantha would go, you know, look at, go on the street. She would mm -hmm. look for a gentleman to pick up. Bring them back to that hotel where Jackson had two rooms reserved for quote unquote tricks. Uh -huh. He stated she wouldn't have deviated from that and she never engaged in sex with a customer in a car. But, you know, for whatever reason, she did deviate that night and whoever she was with that picked her up never, she never brought that man back to the room that night. Okay. The coroner's report told a very gruesome story of her final moments. Iantha had been bludgeoned to death in the head, the upper chest, and neck area, causing a fractured collarbone, facial fractures, and cracks to her skull in more than one area. Her time of death was placed between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. the same day that she was found. The official cause of death was from the brutal repeated beatings to her head, her face was unrecognizable. Wow. Yeah. That sucks. And when I say there were drag marks in, in blood, I'm not talking just a few little. It, it was very bloody, very just, it, it was horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, there wasn't much found at the scene that pointed investigators towards a suspect. Uh So, I mean, they did find a lot of good information, but it's 1977. So there was only so much that information was going to do for them. I want to think that they didn't let the fact that she was a sex worker sway their pursuit. I don't, I'm not saying that it did. I don't Uh know that it did, but that is always a concern, especially in this time period. I mean, even today. You know, some police don't care. You know, these people are asking for it. They're, you know, these women or men that are on the streets, they're asking for it because they're living a quote unquote lifestyle. That's it is such a narrow minded view of something that you don't understand that is a it's a greater it's 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 much more than that. It's not that they're just out there trying to have sex. It's that they are trying to take care of themselves in a way that, you know, can pay the bills. And this is what they have. This is what they have to do. It's just, it's unfortunate that I don't think that sometimes that sex workers get treated as, as humans, as people, you know, they don't get that respect. Yeah. They're disposable people. Right. So I'm, and like I said, I'm not saying that the police at this time did that. I, I do feel that they did, they may not have done it with, you know, all light and love, but they, they did their jobs. And let's put it that way. I can't say what their intentions were, but they did their jobs. Yeah. So as far as, ever, you know, investigators knew at this time, this was an isolated killing. And from what I found, it didn't seem like there was much to go on as far as like connecting anything. There were, of course, other murders, other crimes happening, but not to this degree of violence and with the the beating with the, the beating dragging. and yeah and just the the clear lack of respect for her by the person that did this uh-huh. you know leaving her exposed in the way that that she was leaving her posed and leaving her head covered yeah it just it, there's a lot of information to take away from that but they it didn't it just didn't match anything else that was going on. So imagine their surprise when nine days later, another woman was found and the crime scenes were very similar. The detective who ended up working this new case was no stranger to dealing with sick individuals. At the time of this case, Robert Keppel was already well known and respected for his work um, at that time, investigating the infamous Ted Bundy. Oh yeah. Yeah. He actually later on was one of the few detectives that was able to talk to Ted Bundy in uh, Florida and able to go in and interview him before he was executed. And he actually is the detective that reached, well, was in contact. I've heard that Ted Bundy reached out to him and tried to help him find the Green River Killer. Oh, so, okay. So this is the guy. So he, he really had a lot of, um, you know, this was kind of the start of his career with that kind of stuff, but he, he became a very respected, um, gentleman in this area of, of crime. So on the morning of August 7th, 1977, a call came in that a woman's body had been found at the South Park Marina at 745 AM. The call was answered by the King County Sheriff as the location was just a, like a, literally a block outside of. Seattle city jurisdiction. Okay. So it is a totally different. It was a, a different entity okay. than because Seattle PD is who handled Eantha's case. Okay. This is King County Sheriff. So Keppel was one of the detectives sent out to the scene. And when investigators arrived, they found a crime scene that many of them had never witnessed before uh-huh. and would really never see until the Green River Killer came. The nude body of a small Caucasian woman who would later be identified by her fingerprints could be seen through a chain link fence um, in the Sandy Marina area. Her head had been bludgeoned until it was a bloody mess and there were very obvious bruises and injuries to her body. And when I say very obvious, they were numerous to where whole areas of her body were so bruised and beaten that that looked like her skin. Yeah, it's horrible. 
Her left arm had been broken in several places and was at an odd angle, almost in the shape of an S. Her inner thighs were bruised so deeply on both sides that they're, they were nothing but purple. There were also other bruises they found on her neck, her arms, her to- torso. The body had also been posed with her legs open to expose her private parts. And mind you, she is completely nude. There, are, there is no clothing on her. It was quite clear that the torture she had endured and her death had caused this poor woman enormous amounts of pain. Her clothing had been ripped off and some of it was discarded at the scene, but there was nothing else there to help identify the victim. Jesus. No purse, no ID, there's nothing. What was found wouldn't make sense at the time, but later on would prove to be very key evidence. At the scene, there was evidence that a car had run into one of the steel poles of the gate post. There was dark green paint that had been transferred to the post and signs that blue and gray paint from the post had been scraped off onto something that had hit it. So the, there was a transfer of paint between a large object and this metal post. Oh, first, first clue. Right. First break anyway. Um, it, I mean, it, it really helps them later on. Yes. Okay. Also found at the scene were good impressions of tire tracks. Okay. There were also bits of yellow spongy foam around the victim. Spongy foam? Spongy foam. And it was like shredded. Okay. That's okay. weird. Yeah. Spongy N- foam. Spongy not foam. far okay. from the body, they found a piece of rebar that had been fitted into a metal pipe and it was covered in blood. And from what I read between the rebar and the the pipe that it was fitted into, this was about a four foot weapon. Okay. The autopsy would confirm that this victim was definitely tortured to death. There was a length of plastic wrapped around her neck that had been used as a ligature to choke the victim. She also had a total of 81 fractures all over her body. Keep in mind, this is five not- were from her arm alone. Her left arm. So like defensive. I don't even know you can call that defensive. No, because at some point she was no longer able to defend herself. But yes, I mean, I'm, I, Fuck, she that's tried. That's violent. So violent. Incredibly violent. It is incredibly horrific. There Jesus. was also evidence that the rebar found at the scene had been used to beat the victim as well as to rape and sodomize the victim. Oh, okay. Now you're just. It's gross. Now you're doing too much, dude. That's fucking, yeah. It's it's disturbing on another level. Yeah. Yeah. They fingerprinted the victim in hopes of being able to identify her, and Keppel didn't have to wait long before she was identified as Rosemary Stewart. She also went by the name Rosemary Park. Now, Rosemary was about 26 at the time of her murder, and she also had a history of you know, arrests and and charges of being a sex worker. She was ID'd when a report came in that had been shared from Seattle PD of police response to a call that had come in around 1 a.m. on the night that she was killed. So a witness called in from the International District to report that they had seen a female being beaten by a large man with, quote, bushy hair and glasses. Her clothing, while she's on the street, is ripped off. And she was then forced to get into the trunk of the car. So not only does somebody call in and report that, or, or should I not not only, but somebody calls in and reports this. So the police, they saw it. They saw it. The police don't show up for two hours. Wow. Right. What? Traffic? I know Seattle traffic is bad. Not that bad. Not at one o'clock in the morning. No. Fuck off. So they also were able to give a basic description of the car that it was dark colored and it was some sort of two door sedan. Police eventually show up around 3 a.m. And mind you, yes, it's the international district. This is a well known area at the time for, you know, people walking the street, doing drugs, sex works, all of it. I mean, it, it's not the best part of town, but two hours to show up to somebody saying, 
you know, frantically calling and saying, hey, get down here. There's a woman just put in the trunk of a car and she's being beaten by a man and he is ripping off her clothing on the fucking street. Yeah. You have no excuse to not show up as soon as you can. You have no excuse. No. I, I, it's unreal. So they get there. It's 3 a.m. But of course, there's nothing going on at that point. They did, however, find a purse that had supposedly been dropped during the fight, and they did take that into custody as, quote, unquote, found property. When the ID was looked at and run through the system, it was confirmed that the victim of the kidnapping and the murder was the same person. Seattle PD also shared with Keppel that they were investigating a very similar disturbing case, a murder case, just a few miles away from Rosemary's crime scene. So that victim was Eantha Buchanan. They sent over their case file to share with him, and he felt like in all likelihood the woman had been tortured and murdered by the same person. It was just too much of a coincidence that, you know, within a 10-day period, basically, two women have been found you know, yeah. and it's escalated. Iantha was not, what happened to her was horrible and it was bad enough and yeah. it should never have happened. No. But what happened to Rosemary was even more. And an escalation. Very escalated. Briefly mentioned was that there were also complaints from one or two. I cannot confirm because records are horrible. One or two sex workers that had been attacked in a similar manner in Seattle, and they had filed reports. And their reports matched the description of the man with the frizzy hair who drove a beat up reddish colored truck. That doesn't match the. It doesn't match the description of the car, but it matches. No, but I mean, like the paint that you're saying they found no. in one scene. Right. Sorry. It doesn't. You're right. I'm not sure if it's because of the time period or if the women didn't pursue charges, mm -hmm. but there's absolutely nothing about these victims that is available to research. There's no names anywhere. There's nothing. They're, they're mentioned in like a sentence or two of, you know, that there were, there was obviously reports out there and that's, that's really all it says is, you know, sex, these, these hookers basically is what, what I read. And I'm like, God, you guys, the term like we can only move forward from yes. there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so having the ID of the victim set things in motion, police were able to go to Rosemary's residence and speak to her landlord. Mm -hmm. They learned she drove a white Chevy and that she hadn't been home in days. They searched her home and they found that sadly she was a single mother and she had a young oh, child. No. Yeah. When she had not been heard from, the little girl had been turned over to Child Protective Services by the babysitter she was with that night. And I looked for any mention of what happened to that little girl, but I could find nothing. I, I read something that said she was two years old at the time. Wow. I can't even confirm that. That sucks. It is incredibly sad. I just, I can't imagine this poor little girl, you know, not knowing what happened to her mother. And I, I hope, I just hope that she doesn't know to this day. I really do. Like I, that sounds odd. It's but, the internet. But does she know that that was her mother? If she was adopted? I'm sure she does. I don't know. And I, I really, I hope not for her, like just for her peace of mind. I hope that she got adopted by a loving family and that she went on to have a wonderful life. Cause this is, it's just fucking horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. When investigators go to the industrial district to, you know, search for anything that might be of a help, they actually find Rosemary's car parked near an apartment building. And in it, they find a section of the Seattle Times newspaper's classified section. And it was missing some pages. But it showed the info for the babysitter that Rosemary had used that night that was in that classified section. Are so that, that tells me that she didn't even know who this person was. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. She just found her in the paper and was like, hey, I, guess. I need a babysitter. Yeah. I, I'm not blaming her, but just. I mean, yeah. but it was the 70s. You would do that kind of shit. You yeah. would, you know, people would take out an ad and you would respond to it. And they, you didn't. Yeah. That wasn't a guarantee that they were nice people no, or that they were on the up and the up. There wasn't any way to fact check any of that. Yeah. You know, you just relied on what that person said and meeting them in person. And 
just get your feeling off that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a way different. I can't imagine doing that now. I can't imagine just answering some ads in the paper, you know, and there's, you know, there's nothing much else of use in the car. The, the car is taken into custody for investigators to find any other clues, but it, it is not, you know, it wasn't the time it, like it wasn't part of the scene of, you know, her being taken from the street. Yeah. Her car was parked away from where she was at that time. As it turns out, not one, but two people actually came forward with good amount of information that would lead to the eventual apprehension of the person investigators feel was responsible for both murders. One woman had already come forward with information that helped set a timeline for Rosemary's body being discovered. And I will get to her statement soon. The other was a gas station attendant who gave investigators like literally exactly what they needed to get this murderer off the streets. And when we come back from this break, we'll talk about what the witnesses saw and the information they shared with authorities. The first witness to come forward was a woman who gave her information. Sharon Adams was alone at home during the time when Rosemary Stewart had been tortured and murdered. Um, She was in a mobile home that she shared with her husband, which is about 50 feet from the entrance of the marina. So she really heard everything. It was about 3 a.m. when she heard a car idling very loudly near the gate of the marina, and then the engine shut off. And when she began to hear crashing noises and metal making contact with something, she was frightened. She had no idea what was going on. She had no access to a phone. Apparently, they didn't have a phone in, in their mobile home. So, she, And she's by herself. Her husband's at work, yeah. worked at Boeing, and so he was working overnight. She wasn't, you know, sure if she should leave, what she should do. So after hearing noises that sounded like sexual intercourse, she described it as skin being like slapped rhythmically. And what at first she thought was a young child whimpering. Yeah. She dressed quickly and she got her keys to her car ready in case she needed to leave. She then heard the voice again and realized it was a woman's voice and not a child. And this time she was begging to be left alone. It went quiet and the witness then heard the sound of two car doors being shut, the sound of the car starting and the sound of gravel being moved by the tires as it drove off. She also heard what sounded like the car going up against, like scraping up against the post. Okay. Sharon stayed in her home afraid to do anything And eventually she fell asleep waiting for her husband to return from work. And the next morning when police showed up, she was questioned after the manager of the mobile home site called the police to report the body. After seeing the news reports of police asking for help with any information on the Eantha and Rosemary's murders, a man who was working at a gas station not far from both of these crime scenes called into the police with information that said everything in motion to find the suspect. So in the early hours of August 9th, a big and tall Caucasian man came into the gas station asking for the attendant to fix three broken lights at the rear of his dark green 1969 Dodge Charger. And this was back in the day when you, the gas stations weren't just gas stations. You would get your car fixed at your local garage. You know what I mean? It was a garage. It was a gas station. Sometimes it had a restaurant attached. Sometimes it... It could be a lot of things. Yeah. It was like your neighborhood. Yeah. You, you know, you, know, you your had car, a mechanic and yeah. yeah. So he comes in in the, you know, very early morning with these three broken taillights. And the witness claims that the man was, quote, dripping with blood. But he himself had no visible injuries. Not suspect at all. No. <laughs> at all. I, people just don't go around dripped in blood unless they're Carrie or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's still a movie. That's not real. Right. But I mean, what do I know? It was definitely odd. You know, he had this blood on his face and his hair. It was covering his clothes. But the man claimed that he tells the gas station attendant, attendant that he was, quote, worked over and robbed. 
in like way of explanation of why he was bloodied up and whatever. Yeah. It still doesn't make any sense because the attendant claimed he had no visible injuries. So where are you bleeding from? And why didn't that set off like just warning bells? I don't know. While the attendant began working on the taillights, the man went into the restroom to wash up. And so the taillights were found to have been broken from the inside of the trunk. And when the attendant opened the trunk up, he found bit, like bunches of bits of broken yellow rubber foam as well as what looked like blood. Okay. And while this is odd, it didn't necessarily set off any warning alarms either for the man um, because he had been, you know, he said that the guy told him he had been attacked and robbed. I don't know why opening a trunk with blood and bits of foam in it wouldn't set off an alarm, even if the man had not been robbed. I just, it's not normal. No. It's, it's not. So the man paid him, you know, took off once the light bulbs were replaced. Uh And it wasn't until news broke of Rosemary's murder that the man thought to contact police with the information. I guess he it just was a cool story. Maybe he was stoned. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe he dropped acid earlier and it didn't. Cool story, bro. It is the 70s. It is the 70s. So it could have been anything. His information, though, was vital as he could describe the car and the man in very great detail. Police immediately came and worked the gas station bathroom for any evidence the man may have left behind. And they were able to match blood and hair samples to that of Rosemary Stewart. And the particles of the yellow foam were found at the crime scene. There was some particles that they found at this gas station. And I'm assuming just from looking at the photo that it was the yellow seat foam, the seat foam. Yeah. So she was in the trunk and she was trying oh, to get out. Yeah, yeah. So she had broken off the taillights from the inside, hoping that he would get pulled over by police. Okay. And Ooh, she smart. probably had been trying to dig through so that she could go through the back seat and get into the car and hopefully escape. Yeah. Cause back then they didn't have those safety trunk buttons no, no, like no. they do now and that's what i'm assuming they never confirm that that's what the yellow foam is mm-hmm. they just talk about it and as much as it's found at the scene and then they are able to match it from you know the car and they're able to match it at the gas station so they never they never say what it is i'm assuming that's what it is so they were able to match those blood samples and then all of that info Police and sheriffs put out an APB for a green 1969 Charger and a description of the driver. There were random vehicle stops of green Dodge Chargers all over Seattle and red beat up pickup trucks because they're, you know, they're thinking this is the same guy who's attacked the sex workers and also who's committed these crimes. They're also searching for a tall man about six foot for three. Um, who had, you know, kind of frizzy, bushy hair yeah. and wore glasses. And I don't, I hate to say it, but I th- immediately picture Bob Ross. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he wore glasses, but that's no, who I'm didn't. picturing with glasses. And I hate to say that because I I don't want to think that Bob Ross would do anything like this. I don't want to think ill of, of Bob Ross no. with his happy trees. No. On August 14th, just five days after the murder of Rosemary Stewart, two police officers were out on patrol when they came across a man fitting the description, driving a green charger. The driver was very reckless, almost caused a collision, giving the officers probable cause to investigate the driver in the car, pull him over. Mm -hmm. They followed the driver until he pulled over, parking right behind a, wouldn't you know it, red-colored pickup truck on the street. The officers pulled in right behind him, explaining why had they had followed and you know, why they were stopping to speak with him. And upon asking for identification, the driver Morris Frampton told the officers he was trying to fix the flat on his truck so that it could be moved. Okay. Don't know what he was fixing it with what, but you know, it's a story. While one officer was speaking to him, the other was walking around the vehicles, taking in all the details that he could without raising suspicion. 
So Frampton fit the description of the APB, as well as both of the cars fitting the descriptions from the various reports from the attacks, you know, the sex workers had um, reported, as well as Buchanan and Stewart's murders. Upon closer inspection, the officer noticed that there was rebar in the back of the truck, Mm -hmm. as well as there was damage to the front fender on the right side of the car. Mm -hmm. Both officers also noticed there was what appeared to be a blood stain on the front seat of the car. And Frampton was immediately arrested on suspicion of murder and taken into custody to await questioning by the homicide detectives. The vehicles were taken to the Washington State Crime Lab to be examined, and there was just so much evidence that they found on the Star uh, Charger. Aside from the rebar that matched the you know one at the scene of Rosemary Stewart's murder, the red truck had nothing f- further to help with the case, so it, it was really of no other help. The Dodge, however, had her hair, her blood, and fingerprint samples that all matched back to Rosemary. Oh. There were also tons of the yellow foam found in the trunk of the car, and like I said, I'm assuming that came from the seat when she was trying to escape. Um, we also know she broke the tail lights in hopes of police pulling over the car, and there were multiple smears of blood on the inside hood of the trunk where she was just trying to forcibly open the trunk or make enough noise so that somebody Someone heard. Someone heard, yeah. Right. Without a doubt, Rosemary had been in that trunk. There was there was just no way around it. Yeah. There was also the damage to the fender and the paint marks from having driven into the metal post at the marina, the match of the blue and gray paint and where it lined up on the fender was almost the like the probability of him hitting another post that might have been painted those same colors with matching paint samples. Yeah. And it hitting at the exact spot where it hit they use that evidence almost like a fingerprint. It was that unique Mm -hmm. and that improbable that it could have happened in any other scenario. It was as unique as a fingerprint. So that evidence alone was so damning because of the likelihood that his car had done that and gotten that exact same paint from some other post. Yeah. It was, it just wasn't, it was impossible. There were also elements of blood mixed with sand found on the fender from where the suspect had touched the car. So he transferred sand, hair, and blood onto the car Mm -hmm. as he was shutting the trunk and getting in the car. Okay. The sand um, matches because they were at a marina. Mm -hmm. So they matched the sand near where her body was found to the sand that was found on the car. It was identical. Okay. Unexpectedly, they found blood smears that matched Rosemary's under the car, leading investigators to believe that at one point Rosemary had tried to escape under the car so that she could escape being further attacked. And so, so she, she crawled. Under she the had car. crawled under the car. Oh. And that's probably what the witness Sharon had heard him taking the rebar and it was being hit against something. He was hitting against the car to get her out. To get her out. Yeah. Inside the car, they found the missing pages from the Seattle Times Classifieds ad that had been in her car when they had found her car had the Seattle Times Classified ad Uh with the babysitter's information, but there were pages missing. He had those in his car. Oh, wow. All of these things put together just, I mean, there was no doubt. Frampton was the killer. They didn't need DNA. They didn't need it It, with so much evidence at this point. They didn't need anything. Yeah, the guy was so sloppy. And he had not cleaned his car. No. That's what this uh, Detective Keppel kept commenting on this when I read primarily where I got this information from uh, from his point of view and everything was in a textbook Mm -hmm. that he wrote about signature killers. And he repeated about three times in this section about Morris Frampton. This fucker didn't clean his car. No. Like how There's stupid just, are you to be how, driving around whoa. for over a week? That's how cocky he probably was. He wasn't going to get caught. Right. No. It, and, and you'll know why by the time I'm done with this story. Oh. You're right. He was cocky. He didn't think he'd get caught. Here's where the internet is not as reliable as I would like it to be. And where I hope that, you know, now that, 
COVID precautions are winding down, I can actually go in person to like libraries and uh-huh. get things because I don't know the dates of his trials uh-huh. or exactly what he was charged with. I do know that in the case of Iantha Buchanan, he was acquitted of all charges. Whoa. Yeah, they didn't have strong evidence to link him to that crime, so he was acquitted. Wow. And as far as I know, her I wonder her murder is officially internet. unsolved to this day. No wonder they didn't have much on the internet about it. I I don't <laughs> know. It's just, it's crazy. What if he confesses? No, he, he is, uh, well, I'll get to that. So according to his statements, he was not responsible for that crime. And he has never accepted any guilt in it at all. As for Rosemary Stewart's murder, he was found guilty and he was sentenced to death in March of 1978. I'm not sure if the attack on the other unnamed woman was part of that sentencing or not. The one or two women who had filed reports um, saying that they were attacked. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he was ever charged with that or if that was even part of his sentencing, you know, if there were any charges ever brought to him and, 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 If he was convicted of them. Okay. So you think this is done, right? I mean, it's done. We've got our killer in jail. We know who did. We know a nice little bow. It's all wrapped up. Yeah, but it's not. So there is a lot more. In 1981, Frampton, along with other death row prisoners, appealed and won their cases, claiming that death, the death penalty was unconstitutional. And so then he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, that was overturned as well in 1988 as a court of appeals deemed he was sentenced incorrectly. Somehow the standard ruling for this type of crime is supposed to be 20 years. It's such a fucking inconceivably low amount of time for what this fucker has done. Oh, yeah. And the violence, how just violent the whole act was. Yes. Beating 81 fractures. 81 fractures. And you're telling me that this woman's suffering and the loss of her life is only worth the equivalent of 20 years for this man to be alive, sitting in a jail. Yeah. You know, being fed and, and yeah, I, I don't understand. I will never presume to understand how they come up with these numbers. But the good news is in October of 1988, a King County Superior Court judge deemed that Frampton was an exception to this usual ruling and sentenced him to 50 years in prison. However, with the possibility of parole, still not enough time given his violent history. And this fucker should never have the possibility of parole Mm -mm. ever. So, that brings us to 2005. What? And yeah, so he sat in jail for a while. And in 2005, there were things that were happening as far as cold case units were kind of becoming a thing in the, early, the two, late 90s, early 2000s. So Frampton was serving his prison sentence in Walla Walla at the state pen mm-hmm. um, when a little thing called DNA evidence Uh-oh. caught up to bite him in the ass. Yes. Turns out that the justice system was not done with Morris Frampton yet. The Seattle PD's cold case squad had been working over 550 cold cases. And with the use of DNA evidence becoming more prevalent at the time, they were getting back hits on many cases that had been previously unsolved. Good. So the murder of 48-year-old indigenous woman Agnes Williams from October of 1976 was one of those cases. Agnes Williams' new body was found at the bottom of um, Fermont Gulch. It was confirmed that she died from a combination of asphyxiation and a skull fracture. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. As in the case of Iantha and Rosemary, she had been beaten and violently assaulted. Wow. Police had recovered what they knew to be semen on pubic hairs as evidence. And thankfully, it had not been destroyed over the decades since her murder. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was a much help without something to match it to. I mean, that's just the way that works. Yeah. 
jump forward to 2002, and it's an entirely new world for forensic science. So you may remember the case we just did on um, Chilly Willy, yeah. our friend. And Tinky Winky. Yeah. Well, the same detectives who worked on that case were now working the cold cases in 2002. So Detective Greg Mixell sent in this, uh, the sample of semen on the pubic hair that was found at the scene. And although it took until 2005 for a hit to come back, it was worth the wait. The match was to the man already behind bars for a similar death, Morris Frampton. So Detectives Mixell and Sysniks, I can't say his name, Sysniks, Sysniksky, Mikey Mike. Mikey Mike. Yeah, I, then just I need to call him Mikey Mike. That's what Chili Willie liked to call him. Oh yeah. He they made a trip out to speak with Morris at Walla Walla State Pen, and the detectives tell him that they have something that connects him to a murder, and you know he's he's maintaining that he was not connected to Eantha Buchanan's murder, thinking that's what they're referring to. And they tell him that they have evidence that connects him to the scene of Agnes's death, and he asks what they thought he left behind. And they tell him, well, you left your sperm. And according to an interview I listened to with uh, Mikey Mike, yeah. Frampton claimed that he didn't believe the detectives because he had been, quote unquote, lied to before by them. And they're like, we've never met you before in our lives. Uh, we've never <laughs> lied to you. And they show him the lab report that, you know, spells out that here's the science, here's the match. And he just kind of goes quiet and the interview ends. It's about a week later on October 31st, 2005, that Detective Mixell gets a call from Frampton in prison asking for the detectives to come back and this time bring a lawyer. He claims he, quote, wants to do the responsible thing and he will give them what they want. So the detectives go back on November 7th with a lawyer and they are able to get the details um, from Frampton on the crime. So the event says he tells them that... Um, of the night that he picked up Agnes from a tavern in South Park. So that's obviously his hangout spot because South Park Marina is where Rosemary's body was found. Yeah. So he, he says he picked her up at this tavern. The two drove around in his car in West um, Seattle. He then parked under the Admiral bridge on Belvedere Avenue, where he proceeded to engage in the sexual act with Agnes. His claim was that Quote, it started off consensual, but it didn't end that way. That is the slimiest fucking sentence ever. Yeah. He spent several hours with her, assaulting her while choking her until he killed her. At some point after she was dead, he beat her. So she had already died when he beat her, hitting her head and body. It doesn't make sense. You are so love. fucking sick. I would love to see his FBI profile. Oh, I wish. Yeah. Yeah. Because along with not being able to find much information, I have no history on him. None. Other than he was a, uh, um, he installed sprinkler systems. That's all I know is that that was his job. Like fire ones or like lawn sprinklers? I Sprinkler systems. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, he had rebar, but that could be either construction or outdoors. Yeah. Like he had access to rebar. I was going to say it is Washington. There's n not much need for sprinkler, lawn sprinkler systems. No, but. that's true. And especially in the 70s, there probably wasn't. So, yeah, probably buildings. So after she was dead, he drove down the road and threw her completely nude body down a steep embankment. Or as he described it, quote, left her there. Yeah. Like you just dropped her off at home and said good night. It was a pleasant evening. No, you fucking dumped her. Yeah. Like she was trash. You tossed her. You didn't just leave her there. So he took her clothes and, you know, tossed them somewhere else before returning to his home, which was about a mile away from the scene. Yeah. So he definitely lived in that area. Um, Detective. Sizinski claims that while giving this information, Frampton was just void of any emotion. He he was just retailing a tale. It didn't affect him whatsoever. And that's how I know he's a psychopath. Yeah. In October of 2006, nearly 30 years after the crime, 
At 59 years old, Morris Frampton was convicted and later sentenced to the second degree murder of Agnes Williams. So he was moved to the correctional facility in Aberdeen to serve out the remaining term of his prior sentence for Rosemary Stewart. After that, he would begin the new sentence at a minimum of 17 years to life for Agnes Williams' murder, meaning he is eligible for parole in 2000. 28. I hope to God it's never granted to him. Yeah. I hope he never gets paroled. Yeah. I really, it, you cannot allow somebody like this back into society. You just can't. It doesn't matter that he spent the last, you know, 30 years plus in jail. And it doesn't matter if he's 85 years old at this point. I yeah. don't care. Yeah. He doesn't deserve to be out in society. No. So one thing that I want to mention, a couple things is that while Robert Keppel felt that Frampton was responsible for Eantha Buchanan's murder, Detective Sizinski did not agree with that. It, it, he, he said, yeah, I mean, the likelihood of finding two women that were murdered in a very similar way at that time might have been low, but that doesn't mean it wasn't possible. No. So, I, yeah, maybe. I don't know. And as I said, Frampton was acquitted of the charges. So it is quite possible that he was not responsible for Eantha's murder. Mm -hmm. However, without Seattle PD sharing some of that information with the King County sheriffs and Detective Keppel, we might not have, you know, they may not have caught him for Rosemary's murder. Yeah. Another thing I want to mention is just the complete lack of respect for the victims in this case online. Most of where information can be found on Eantha and Rosemary's cases also include the crime scene photos of the victims. And I mean the fucking nude, bloody bodies of these women. Full frontal nudity. Just available online. Really? Yes. You can see the injuries. You can see everything. And it's all out there on the internet for anybody. And it saddens me because there are no other photos of these women from before their deaths to be found anywhere. Hmm. I felt it was very disturbing and it lacked respect for these women and their families that these photos are out there like this. And if I could not have looked, I would not have. But most of the information... I found is in conjunction with these photos. So I didn't, I tried to look as little as possible, but I couldn't not look because that's where the information was. Yeah. It was, you know, like a paragraph and then a photo and then a paragraph and then another photo. And I, I hate that. That is that is something that as as, you know, blogs, true crime blogs and podcasts put their information out there. You're getting it wrong. That is wrong. Yeah. And these women don't deserve to have that on the Internet. Not only that, but it's that is not something for the general public to know and see. No, it's just not. The descriptions were bad enough to see it is it. it's not right. It's not not respectful no it's not Mm. and and i don't know if it's because they whoever has made these available has first of all i'm kind of surprised that they haven't been taken down i think they're out there it's just it's it's done it's done yeah and it's multiple places but it's it's for sensationalism you know oh yeah and yeah, please know that I will, of course, list my sources. I I will because we, I, you know, that's just what we do. I, if I see information, you know, I listened to another podcast that interviewed Detective Sazinski. I'm going to list that because it, you know, it's part of what, what we do. We're mm-hmm. trying to be as honest and, and upfront as possible. I'm going to not link. We're not going to share the link of the articles. I'm not going to make it any easier for somebody to just click on a link and go right to these pictures from our 
from our description oh. when we post it because I am truly just it it saddens me that this is what is left in this world of information on these ladies is the horrible way that they were treated the horrible way that they died and they're forever remembered in these photos this way yeah and there's nothing else out there on them nothing and it just is it makes my heart ache yeah I so I wouldn't even list them if I didn't have to I mean to be honest with you if if I could get away with it not doing it I really would not want to but I will list the information but I'm not adding a link okay so yeah just so everybody knows so yeah that's uh Morris Frampton it's a lot he was a he was a sick fucker. Yeah. And yeah, I you're right. I would like to know I would like to see a FBI breakdown on it on him. Well, it's too late now. What the hell is wrong with him? I mean it's too late now. So, uh, Cuz he's already caught. Like I that's what one of my favorite parts, you know, like the FBI profile. Like oh, it was like, you know, getting the information and then you're like, how do they know that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, like, especially like, I think the one that I was most fascinated by was the Butcher Baker. Oh, yeah. How they knew he had a stutter. And that he had set fires. Yeah. I was like, what the? Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know that? Because nothing he was doing <clears throat> had anything to do with fires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talking about another sick fucker. Uh, this, this, I told you we were... We were going into a disturbing case. Very sick individual. Definitely. Yeah. But, you know, hey, season four finale. Out with a bang. We're, we're always out with a bang. There's always a bang. But, yeah. Um, I Please do not go and look at those photos, though, guys. Please. Yeah. Please don't. Just have the respect for the... For the victims and, and yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. I, I, I wish that I had just could have gotten the information without seeing it, but it, it's even in the, in the book is the thing. Cause I, I, I mentioned, yeah. I read that like textbook they're in the textbook, which is I'm sure how they got out there in the first place, Yeah, but that's meant to be in a textbook for investigators who are learning how to profile, learning how to see, you know, MOs and, and things like that. Yeah. That's, I should never be privy to that. It just, it's, it's not okay. So yeah, that's all I got this time. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. You don't even know what to say. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't either. It's a real Ex- sick fuck there. Except for he's still alive too. That's the thing. Yeah, well. I just, I, yeah. So, yeah. Isn't this how we end the season? <laughs> this is how we end the season. All right. <laughs> yeah. So when, what do we look forward to? So next up is going to be April 13th. So oh. just a couple weeks on a Wednesday, we are releasing the collab with Elise from True Crime Cat Lawyer. Okay. So the 13th is part one and the 20th will be part two. And then we will have the dates up in May when our next collab episode will be with her. Okay. So that'll be a monthly series. And then What the Fucks are back June 1st. Yay. And hopefully we will have a lineup in between um, that we can release some of our friends podcasts yeah you know episodes to introduce you to some friends of ours yes yeah but we will definitely give that information and uh, make sure that you guys are all aware of the dates and uh yeah and we'll we'll do better to be present on social media do our best Try and, and, uh, we'll try. Meaning, I will do my best because you you don't you don't ever. Yeah, I do. When? 
Usually on the WTF ones. <laughs> yeah, you know. I think I'm just going to hand over the WTFs to you. <laughs> no. Yeah, and no, you no, can no, record no. the WTFs, and I'll just sit here and, and I can't. Enjoy. You're breaking up, honey. And You're breaking up. No, I'm not. I can't. You can hear me just bad. fine. No, the connection is, we're not it's on a bad. phone. It's bad. Stop it. <laughs> All right, guys. We thank you so much for tuning in, and we really appreciate your support. And Thank we, you. We just love doing what we're doing, and we're going to keep doing it. And from all of us, the podcast puppies and everybody, take care of each other and stay out of the damn woods. Stay out of the woods. We'll see you in the next season. Bye, everybody. Bye. What Happens in the Woods is an independent podcast and is managed and produced by Gospel for the Rebels, LLC. Research and content are presented by host Jessica, with all editing and producing done by your favorite resident techie price we believe in transparency and will always list our sources and information in our episode notes we are always looking for new cases and stories to tell we welcome your interaction with us on facebook and instagram at whit podcast and at twitter what happens in the woods i n t two or if you prefer our website is what happens in the woods.com The campfire is open to all. Thank you for your continued support of our podcast. If you love us and want to continue to hear us bring you episodes, please share and like us wherever you can. But the best way to help us grow is to hit all five stars and review us on whatever platform you get your podcast fix. Until we meet again, campers, stay safe and stay out of the damn woods.